And so there's something that happens around in business about it's a team sport. We're in this together. And the fact that you're a partner, we're going at it the same way. I'll give you even an example of something just because we're given financial examples. Mm -hmm. If you're the sole owner of your business, 100% equity, there's zero oversight. Basically, you can go in there and strip $10,000 out of that account in a heartbeat. Who's holding you accountable? Your bookkeeper? So the big question is this, how do small business owners like us grow our leadership, develop our teams and scale our business in a way that allows us to get our products and services out to the world yet still remain profitable? That is the question and this podcast will give you the answers. I'm Bradley Hamner and this is the Club Capital Leadership Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Club Capital Leadership Podcast. My name is Bradley Hamner, your host. In today's episode, we recast a podcast that I did on the Bright Vibe podcast with Matt Lilly. I think I did this back in early March. I think it's whenever this podcast released, and hopefully it will serve all of you along your journey in small business. So without further ado, here's a recast that I did with Matt Lilly on his pod, the Bright Vibe podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Autopilot Recruiting. Join over 1,200 State Farm agents in putting your recruiting on autopilot. Any successful insurance agent will tell you how important team is. Finding those rock star team members doesn't happen when left to chance. It happens through consistent recruiting. You never know when you're going to lose a team member. And the key to an incredible team is constantly searching for the best talent. Autopilot Recruiting is a continuous recruiting service where you'll be assigned a recruiter that has been trained to recruit on your behalf every business day. This recruiter will take over and revamp your career plug, send out assessments, do pre screen phone interviews, and schedule your in-office interviews. All you need to do is to show up and give a thumbs up or a thumbs down. This ongoing service is extremely affordable and a no-brainer for taking your insurance agency to the next level. Listeners of the Club Capital Leadership Podcast, go to autopilotrecruiting.com and use the code CLUBCAPITAL to get started. Again, autopilotrecruiting.com and use the code CLUBCAPITAL to get started. Bradley Hamner, welcome to the show today. Matt, it's great to be with you. Yeah, great to be with you. We talked pre-show. We have a lot of stuff we could talk about. We can talk about business, entrepreneurship, leadership, personal development. You have a website and a business that's called Business Growth Curator and businessgrowthcurator.com. But the one thing that I had the biggest question about is you have something on there called the Rainmaker's Dilemma. And you talk about this Rainmaker's Dilemma. If you don't mind, we'll start there and then we'll back up and find out who you really are. But let, yeah. let's start with, let's start with what is Rainmaker's Dilemma? Yeah, good question. All right. So really what we mean by that is how your greatest strength as an entrepreneur uh-huh. can become a debilitating weakness oh, in your that. business. So I think that there's, I see some books behind you. I'm Uh a a pervasive reader. I've got a lot of books in my library. I love to read. I've learned so much. And there's a kind of a prevailing ethos out there that you should focus on your strengths Mm -hmm. and then delegate all of your weaknesses. Okay. Well, here's what I think for founders, business owners, entrepreneurs, specifically if they're less than a million dollars in top line Mm -hmm. revenue, maybe less than 2 million for sure too is that they hear that and they go, okay, that sounds good. I'll do that. Well, what are they good at? A lot of them are naturally gifted at sales, Mm -hmm. business development, being with the customer, customer service, those type of things. Yeah, of course. Yep. And so what ends up happening, because that was the thing that they did to get the business off the ground. You had the Mm -hmm. energy to start it. Well, the thing that actually helped you to start that business and get it off the ground and get it to where it is today $500,000 $500,000 in top line revenue, 750 mm-hmm. is exactly the thing that ends up standing in the way for you to be able to really grow and scale that company. Right. And so what ends up happening is you end up running out of time as the business mm-hmm. owner or founder. And a lot of them hit this, in some cases, metaphorical, and then in mm-hmm. other cases, literal brick wall. Okay. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. they just yep. burn out completely. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. And so, I mean, I'm not the first person to talk about burnout in business, et cetera. Mm-hmm. It happened to me. Okay. Mm-hmm. So for everything that we do and everything we create, I'm patient zero, right? I was the person. <laughs> so really, I think about me. You're the spreader. Like, You're the spreader. I, You're patient zero. <laughs> exactly. Yep. And so, but yeah, I mean, that's what we mean by the rainmaker to lemon. We think that how do you go from being the rainmaker to the architect of your business? Mm. And certainly, yes, the thing that 
you know, I went through some, or I've gone through a lot of executive coaching and like and executive training as a participant. And they, they say over and over, the thing that got you there is also the thing that won't take you forward. And the first time I started hearing about this, the Adesis life cycle of a business, right? So you get to a certain point where those very things that you're super good at that made your business start to your exact point are also the things that don't allow you to, I would say, scale. And then through the leadership training and the books and everything I'm read, it's the philosophy I adopted later in my business career was how can you replicate yourself or how can you replace yourself? You know, if I'm not constantly figuring out who can do my job, then guess what? My company can't grow because I'm always the bottleneck, right? I'm always the, the one keeping us from growing because I think I have to do this thing. And I think that's a kind of, I think it's a misnomer and I've heard it so often from small business owners and entrepreneurs. Well, I'm the only one that can do that, right? Well, I'm the only one that really knows, or, well, if it's going to get done right, I have to do it. And it's like, get over you. I mean, in my own opinion, I'm like, get over yourself, right? Because you're, you're, you're just being arrogant and you're being stupid, not, and you don't even know it, but it's like, you can find somebody to do it better than you. I don't care what it is. There's somebody on the face of the earth that can do that one function specifically you're talking about better than you can 100%. because, because they're a specialist in it. Right. And how, what do you run into, you know, cause you're actually coaching uh, idiots like me. So what do you, <laughs> what do you actually run into? I think everybody really gets the idea of being able to level themselves up, delegate tasks off of them. The problem is, is they won't slow down long enough to be able to actually figure out how to do that mm -hmm. and then how to train someone else. A lot of the founders, entrepreneurs are terrible trainers. I mean, they just don't know how to train people, you know, they're like, oh right. my gosh, I got to put together this again, system. Like, right. they're like, yes, I need to have systems. But I don't have time to do that. So I'm just going to go rain make the story. It's effectively a lie that you're right. telling yourself is one day, one day, one day, one right. day. Okay. If I can get it from 20 to 30,000, I'll be good. If I can get it from 30 to 50,000, then I'll be able. Well, all to, my problems will be solved. All my problems will go away. It's like, <laughs> you know, the further you want to go, the faster you want to get there, actually, the more problems that you're going to face along right. the way, you know? Right, and right. so, I do believe in using money to buy back your time. And right. you know, you had mentioned about VAs and we can talk about yep. certainly that. So so I think that people get the general idea. I think it when it comes down to it's the application, it's the implementation, the execution mm -hmm. of a philosophy is where the biggest difference is. Again, if you're doing $10 million in top line revenue, look, you've got a team, you've probably got right. a C-suite of people yep, yep, around yep, you. Yep, yep. Right. This doesn't apply to you. Okay. Right. That's why specifically all of my clients do less than $2 million in top line revenue. Right. Okay? Yep. They do. And I've been, I don't mean to cut you off there, but I've been thinking about that as well because I've got companies that I've founded that do a lot more than 2 million in revenue. And then I've got companies that I founded that do less than 2 million in revenue. And as an entrepreneur, I also see, I think what you just said, which is once you get to that 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars worth of top line revenue, you can pay for resources. You can pay for good coaches. You can pay for good consulting and you can hire people. Like when we were growing, we were growing a healthcare company at the time. We got to a certain point where we realized that we were kind of suffering from founder syndrome, which is we were great entrepreneurs. We were great rainmakers, right? We love to go out and do deals. Let's go build another building and hire, you know, and all that. But man, we sucked at scaling. We sucked at all the infrastructure and all the systems. Right. And so we literally through coaching because we could afford to pay co for coaching, right? We paid close to a hundred, well, 75, to hundred grand for really good consultants and coaches. Yep. And, and they were like, if you don't listen, you're going to go off the track. Well, most people to your point doing 2 million or less a year in top line revenue, they're not going to spend a hundred grand. They don't have that kind of money to deploy for that type of insight. Right. And so I think it's so important for, especially like the work you're doing really, because that's where all the growth in America comes from. That's where all of our freedoms come from. In my opinion, the bulk of them come from small business and entrepreneurs who are in that zero to or maybe a hundred grand a year to that 2 million. I think that's a whole society and community of people that really need to come together more and learn from each other. Yeah, absolutely. Not only can you pay if you're at five, $10 million, can you pay for great coaches, consultants? I think actually even more than that, the people on your team there is a massive difference. I'm just going to call it a little like it is. There is a massive difference between the skill set of somebody uh -huh. who's at $50,000 uh -huh. and somebody who's making $200,000. Yes. 
Totally. This is a big difference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You hire somebody in your team and they're making a quarter of a million dollars because they're capable. They have capabilities. They are coming to you and yes. telling you, Matt, yes. Yeah, that's this exactly is how right. we're doing this. <laughs> right. That's great that you did it this way. The opposite, but, but, but we're not going to do it that way. We're not I, doing it that way. I, 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 I'm laughing because I, I I do remember the first day, literally in the office that I was in when we hired that guy and that guy was scaling us. I was pulling in the parking lot and somebody called me and they needed a check, and so I was calling our account. And you know, now we had an accounting department. I was calling our accounting department. I was like, hey, I need that check cut for two grand or whatever it was, and they said, okay, well we'll get that for you on Monday. And yeah. I was like, <laughs> like what? I yeah. was like, I was pissed off for like a little bit. And then I was like, oh, this is working. Yeah. This is work. Yeah. They told me no. This is a yes. first, you know, they yes. and I, so I was just laughing. I didn't mean to cut you off, but I was just laughing. I was like, yeah, I remember when that happened to me, that it was like for a while there was a big contention between how we got here and how we were going to have to move forward. And there was a lot of internal butting of heads. So you're right. That person that comes in at that integrator, that operator, that COO, that whatever you want to call them, right? They come, it's a different animal. They are. They have experiences and skill sets that has given them the experience needed to be able to justify them making 20,000 a month, 30,000 a month. And they're coming in and saying, this is how we're going to do things. And you're learning things from them. Right. Whereas in the early days, as at a business that's doing 30,000 a month, as an example, mm -hmm. people are, are bought into your vision. Yep. Yes. But they're sitting around going, what are we doing? Like, right. you know, you got to tell us what to do. And so you're kind of air traffic control a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And so you can't go hire that person at 20000 a month, in my example, because that's your entire budget of the entire company. Right. <laughs> right. That's all your profit, right? And right. Well, exactly. Your top line. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so that ends up becoming like, oh, my gosh, how do I do this? And so, yeah, how do you make the mindset shift and then the literal shift in our eyes of going from being just the rainmaker of your business to becoming the architect of your business. And so that's skill set, that's mindset, and then that's actually some tools. That's some literal tools of how to do it. I mean, there's business owners we work with that financially do really well. Let's say they do maybe $800,000 in top line revenue, but their financials are a mess. I mean, yeah. they have no idea. They don't know what their profit margins are. Right. They don't know how much they're paying. They don't know how much they're investing in they don't team. Know their true they don't know financial KPIs, right? They don't, they don't know have any financial KPIs. Right, yeah, right. right. Yeah. And it's a skill set that they can learn. I mean, they clearly yeah. they're smart enough. Yeah, to that's get something you are. can learn. You're right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, no question. That's just one example. Mm -hmm. And and so, well, let's back up. So we jumped right in because a lot of times I just like to jump right into a conversation. It's like midstream. We no, that's great. <laughs> um, I love it. Um, but let's talk about your background. So how, how did you get here? Why do you care about business? How did you get the education around kind of seeing those differences and different levels and where you, you personally can be most effective in people's lives. So just give us a little bit about your business background. Let's start there. Mom and dad, both small business owners. My dad mm -hmm. is still a small business owner to this day. He's in the farming operation. He does oh. about $5 million in top line revenue. Mm -hmm. I had really bad allergies, so I was never destined to, <laughs> uh, to, do to be a farmer. No, I was never going to be a farmer. I'm not what, a farmer. What's he farm? I'm curious because I'm from farm country. You're, now, are you in Iowa? Is that where you're at? I'm seeing a helmet Alabama. Back there. Alabama. Alabama. I'm sorry. What, Alabama. what helmet? That, that's, a, that's an Auburn helmet. That's an Auburn helmet. Oh, I apologize. And yeah, I know yeah, that's probably yeah, a big yeah. issue. I got, I got the, Alabama. I hear out the people here in Alabama, they're like, you're an Alabama fan? I'm like, no, Auburn. Like, right Auburn. Here. Anyway, so, <laughs> I, so you're, in, you're in Alabama. That's not a West Coast accent, is what you're saying. Okay. That's not. It's not. Not a West Coast okay. accent. So, not. what's your dad grow? I'm just curious. Wheat, soybeans, oh. corn are his yeah. main ones. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And and is he in Alabama? He is. Yeah. Northwest part of Alabama. I didn't mm -hmm. know they grew. I didn't know they farm. Yeah. And I know this is a little sad. I, I'm in Kansas. So this is farm country. I grew up like driving and I had allergies too, which was always interesting to work on the farm. Oh, okay. The, uh, in, two in of my clients are in Kansas and I know Kansas. Uh, so I've got, I'm actually coming up there to visit some of them. So I had to find, find uh, where, where you where, are and we'll go have a beer. Where, where are you headed? Wichita. Oh my gosh, that's yeah, exactly where I'm at. That's so no funny. way. No, no, Wichita. Okay, I'm sitting right in like the middle of Wichita, Kansas. I'm no, seriously, I have, a, I have one of my really good clients, and actually, one of my associate coaches is in Wichita. Would you be able to say the name of the company? Yeah, we can talk offline. Okay, and, okay, yeah yeah, 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 we'll talk offline. I'll tell you who it is. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. That's awesome. That's so, <laughs> isn't it? Such a small world. It is um, a small world. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a, yeah, that's part of what I'm noticing, the older I get, the more I notice that your network of people that you surround yourself with and that you engage with is super critical to the quality and the ability for you to get things done. 
Oh, hundred percent. I do believe in the mantra. Your network is your net worth. Net worth. I do believe yeah. that. You no, know, those little phrases get thrown around a lot, but that's one I do believe. Yep. Yeah, I totally agree. Okay. So I probably, I got us off topic. So your dad's a farmer. You, you're from Alabama. You're both your parents were entrepreneurs. Um, yep. Yes. Okay. All right. So the biggest thing around the reason I say that about my dad, and obviously you being in farmer country, you'll relate to this, is that the thing that I picked up from my dad the most, and I'm so grateful for, is the value of hard work. Yeah. Okay. Work ethic. Work my, ethic. Work ethic. Absolutely. Work ethic. Yep. Mm -hmm. And listen, here's the thing about that. I caught it. I wasn't necessarily taught it. I just yep. watched my dad. Yeah. Okay. You were, you were around. It was your life, right? You just it was my life. it all the time. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's, so he taught FFA and agriculture at my yeah. high school from, yeah, yeah. from eight to three. He'd come home and I'll tell people he changed from his duck heads at the time to his, <laughs> his car hard overalls. <laughs> quite, literally put on his good clothes. He did. Um, <laughs> yeah, but then if it. it was, if it was harvesting season or yep. planting season, they would be in the fields until two, three, four in the morning. Cause that's what oh, yeah. they had to do. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's just what you out. do. Yep. And so, right. and I saw him work seven days a week and he's still to this day, as much as his son preaches, taking time off, he does not <laughs> listen to this at all. So I picked that up from my dad. And I'm so grateful for that. So I started my business in 2010 mm -hmm. and I mean, I just went to work. I mean, I started with no customers. I had very, very little money, specifically about $40,000 that mm -hmm. I had saved mostly from a house that I'd sold a couple of years prior to get the business off the ground. And I went to work. I mean, I, you know, was obviously the primary salesperson and I'll tell you a quick story about financials. Mm -hmm. So if you see my degree behind me uh, from Auburn, mm -hmm. I got my degree in, fi in finance. Oh, and interesting. so you would think small business father. Okay. Mm -hmm. Small business father degree in finance from Auburn University that I would understand small business financials. <laughs> my third year, my right. accountant says, congratulations, you made your first profit. I said, fantastic. How much was it? And I was using, this is so embarrassing, but I've just said it enough now. Yeah. I was using Quicken, not QuickBooks. Yeah, yeah no, okay. I get it. Yep. I was yep. using Quicken at the time. Yep. Yep. And I had about $100 in the account that day. He tells me this. And he says, you made $32,000 last year. And I said, fantastic. Where's that money? <laughs> he said, right. well, you spend it. Spend it. I said, I don't, what does that mean? I don't understand. I have $100 in my bank account. Right. He said, well, that was profit. It's not cash. I said, I, what are you talking about? I don't get that. And he's kind of, you know, being an accountant. Mm -hmm. And I was so frustrated. He said, then, by the way, you owe the IRS $9,000. I said, <laughs> wait like, a minute. Ow. I have $100 in my bank account. <laughs> right. I made my first profit is $32,000, and I owe the IRS $9,000? <laughs> this just something just like, screw this small business stuff. Like, I'm out, you know? And so but that, is a, that is a dead true story. I ended up having yeah. to borrow the money to pay, to pay my taxes. <laughs> yeah, it's a really bad yeah. deal. That's part of my journey. It's why Your actually education. And, yes. Yes. Yeah, part of my, <laughs> my R and D, I guess, you know, for, <laughs> right, for yeah. others. So anyway, I mean, it went on and I ended up actually really burning myself out in 2014, 2015. I was truly like my father burning the midnight oil. I mean, we, you know, getting the business off the ground, we were doing well sales wise, but I mean, mm -hmm. financials were really struggling. I hit a brick wall myself. I mean, I actually ended up going to, I didn't know what a panic attack was. I was having oh, uh -huh. panic attacks. Um, yep. I went, saw an internal medicine doc. I, I went, saw a cardiologist over a period of time. And they were like, no, you're fine. You need to slow it down. You're going right. to, you're going to burn yourself out. And so, look, I wish I could tell you, Matt, that that day walking out of the cardiologist all my life, you know, changed dramatically. <laughs> well, it did, but it was a lot of slow steps. I yes, mean, it wasn't right. just like one thing. It was like, okay, what do I do? Because the thing I'm doing now is not working. I need mm -hmm. to begin to change. And so- mm -hmm. That was a three or four year journey. I ended up getting around some really brilliant entrepreneurs. I really, at that time, found, I didn't even really have that word entrepreneurship, but I mm -hmm. just got around other people that were doing some really big things and it was inspirational to me. Mm -hmm. And I really began to fall in love with what I now would say is the business end of business. And so since then, I've started a, uh, several other companies and and uh, I didn't have the language around at that time, obviously, of oh, I'm rainmaking. That's what mm -hmm. I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But now looking back on it, that's obviously what I ended up doing is I started to transition and build, you know, I hate just even throwing out systems and processes. Okay. Cause that gets thrown around so much, you know, right. I told you before, like, I hate oh. like, like surface level stuff, mm -hmm. but I did begin to say, okay, my mindset has got to change and I need some tangible tools yep. to run my financials. 
I need some tangible tools of how to build a good sales process. Mm -hmm. I need to know how to set targets and priorities in the business. How do I measure? How do I create a school board that actually works? I kept switching compensation plans for my team members all the time. Okay. Mm, right. Like, I didn't have growth tracks in place for my team. So they would come in and then they were like, I've been with you for two years. Am I just going to do this for the rest of my life? Like <laughs> those type of things really mattered. I needed to create more structure into the mm -hmm. organization because mm -hmm. it was just a free for all. 99.99% of the time, that's how entrepreneurs do it. They yep. just kind of get in. It's kind of like they get in, they start swimming, they get some success on the sales side or on the customer side, and then they figure it out as they go along. And yep. I think the ones that are able to figure it out sooner, scale faster and build bigger stuff and more impactful stuff, right? They and do. And, and I'll even say, I don't mean to interrupt you there. But no, I go, for it. go say, for it. I also yeah. think that's why. So like one of my mentors, his last seven companies mm -hmm. has scaled to a million dollars in ARR in 12 months. Right. I mean, he yep. is just like, yep. okay, you know why? He's got the template. He, he's, he knows how to, yeah, it's a, he, knows, he's, how to he knows how to dial it in. He knows X, he does. You know, one plus one equals 100%. 17, right? I mean, he knows from, how to scale. From, from concept right. to audience building, the whole yep. thing, like he's got yep. it. Well, you got to go back and know his story to realize, okay, it's not like, necessarily it doesn't have to be littered with failures. Okay. I'm not saying right. that, but it wasn't like that, that the first business, okay, just boom, it takes <laughs> off. I mean, Jeff Bezos maybe with Amazon, but no, no, kind of a, he, yeah, yeah. He had some failures in there and yeah. he's had a lot of failures in Amazon. Since. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I think that that is where you, like you said, a lot of people start that way. And then when you start hearing about an entrepreneur that starts another one, it's like, oh, that one got better. Okay. And then the next one's like, oh, that one got better. They, mm -hmm. they just begin to kind of stack their skill sets. And then it becomes not one plus one equals two, right. but one plus one equals four. Yep. And then two plus two equals 10. It becomes a multiplying effect mm -hmm. of their skill sets whenever they go and start another business. From my view, that's a rarity versus the norm is the ability to replicate success in different industries or in different, the guy you're talking about, from my perspective, he's gotten really good at the systems and the formula, and he's just applying that more than likely to business, different businesses, but he's got a set formula. He's probably, my guess is whatever businesses he's starting are probably either service businesses or they're, they kind of stay in a certain delivery method. He's using that delivery method formula, and it wouldn't matter if it was carpet cleaning or house mm -hmm. cleaning. You know, that's just my guess. Where most entrepreneurs, I think, get stuck in the uh, back to kind of the scaling. And you know, we've gotten outside of our wheelhouse several times and got butchered on those deals, right? Yeah. Because we thought we could apply these principles to this other thing. And then we got there and went, oh no, these aren't, <laughs> this doesn't work at all. So he's probably dialed in that there's a certain formula he's using with a certain business. Not that he could apply that same thing in every business. Just my guess. And you could tell me I'm wrong. You are absolutely right. He has gone from service-based businesses and now he's he's got a SaaS company that's uh -huh. that's gotten yeah. about a $50 million valuation. Let me share with you something yeah. that he shared with me. Mm -hmm. That is a huge part of his success and it has influenced me massively. And the reason I want to share this is not just because of its idea, mm -hmm. but because it's the inverse of how I used to think. Okay. Yeah, please. Yes. So I used to, if you go back five or six years ago, I was a big advocate, hold on to equity. Do not give equity out of your company. You started it. You hold hundred right. percent. You bear, right. You're better off to go to a bank, borrow the money because yeah. cheaper <laughs> yeah. than the future equity, right? Did that too, yeah. I could not be more opposite. And <laughs> I so agree. I remember somebody asked him on a call, Yeah. on a call, my mentor, they said, so how long would you go before you actually brought in a partner? And he said, that's a good question. He said, I think about six hours. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I and love he's it. so I love it. Here's his here's his here's yep. his point. Yeah. He absolutely will not start a company without a team. A partner. Yep. yep. Right. From the get go. In fact, yep. he thinks the ideal number is three. Like this is always every I love doing podcasts. I know you have a podcast as well. I love doing podcasts because I feel like in my life, the day that I'm doing the podcast with like you today, you're telling me what I need to know today because I agree that there's something about 
this three thing. I don't know if it's mm -hmm. the trilogy, you know, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, or just different avatars or different person archetypes, or I don't know what it is. I was just literally thinking that the other day. It's like, do I bring on one partner in projects I'm wanting to start? And then I was thinking the same thing. It's like, there's some magic, like the business that I have, that's the biggest, which is a healthcare company. And we provide senior care. And I've said it many times on the show, I'm long-term skilled nursing, assisted living, all things senior care was three partners. There was three of us and we grew wow. super fast yep. and faster than probably we should have. And we took on tons of debt and we did all, we made all the mistakes and now we're kind of restructuring and not mm -hmm. through bankruptcy, but just restructuring and kind of getting ready for phase two. But it, but I did notice that there was some magic to that all for one, one for all, mm -hmm. you know, kind of that, that thing of three. So that's amazing. Sorry. I'm, I'm just, I'm processing Bradley, I'm just processing the information, but I'm doing it live time. But I'm just like, I do believe there's some magic in the power of thing. And for a long time, I was, and still till this conversation have had some like, do I really want to partner again? Because there also comes uh, an expectation of accountability. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you can't hide in a partnership and some partnerships, not that I've been in, but I've heard of some partnerships that are really, really bad right? Yep. People get into some pretty shitty partnerships. Sure. So, no, no so, question so about selecting, that. So selecting your partners is, is key. Absolutely. Well, but I mean, the, the ability, um, I, I, I do, I'm, I, I love sports. I mean, I'm a, I'm a yeah. sports person. And so, you know, I played golf in college, which had this, yeah, it's an individual sport, but you were playing on a team. Yep. And there's a reason why if you, if you watch golf and you, and you listen to Justin Thomas, Tiger Woods, and those guys, they say, oh, we love the Ryder Cup. And the mm -hmm. reason is, is because they're playing, they're playing for the not team. just the country, but they're playing for that team. team they're right. playing for that team room. And so there's something that happens around in business about it's a team sport. We're in right. this together. And the fact that you're a partner, we're going at it the same way. I'll give even an example of something just because we're given financial examples. Mm -hmm. If you're the sole owner of your business, 100% equity, there's zero oversight. Basically, you can go in there and strip ten thousand dollars out of that account in a heartbeat. Who's holding you accountable? Your bookkeeper? No, no, no. no. Your bookkeeper's not. Your bookkeeper's going to say, "What was that withdrawal for?" I don't know. Distribution. You know. Right. 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 Well, Matt, if you and I started a whatever right. company together, yes. and I was like, "Hey, dude, I was looking right. at the account last night. Where did ten grand go?" Oh, right. I was just taking it out, man. I was just, we're wanting to do some stuff on our back porch. I'd be like, wait a minute now. Wait a minute. <laughs> I mean, you would think twice about doing that. Clearly. Of course. Oh, okay? yeah. You, would, you, you wouldn't do it. You I mean, you just wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. Unless... I, I've got partners in a lot of stuff. You just don't do it unless. Now, I have had the deal where, hey, I need to take the 10 grand out. Here's what I'm going to need it for for four or five days. I'm going to put it back in. But I told my partners, and they're like, yeah, we're cool with that. And I've done yeah. it the reverse, right? If they needed something out and it made sense, it's like, yeah. I think obviously you probably heard stories where people take it out and don't tell their partners. And that's where we have bad partners. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> well, I mean, that then gets into a whole thing of like, well, okay, well, did the person you choose to be on, be a part right. of your team, a, a character issue and right, you know yeah. all of those things. Okay. Right. But we also have to look at the other side to say that if you're wanting to be able to grow the company, the collective wisdom of three people, the shared ownership, mm -hmm. the shared vision, the shared camaraderie of yep. being able to build something, doing something, having a vision, a purpose, a mission behind what you're doing, mm -hmm. that becomes very unstoppable because right. people are bought into it. I had a call yesterday with, we're planning our retreat. That's going to be in April for all of our members down in Destin. And there's five of us on a call. And it's mm -hmm. like, you can't replicate that if I'm by myself with a legal pad. Like, I, mm -hmm. you know, I can get fired up, but it's right. like, I want to share that with other people. And then you can't do that unless you have other folks. And so, and let me say, listen, you have a team, like pretty much everybody I work with has between two and 12 team members. Okay. Yep. Yes. Your team is a part of that. Your actual employees are a part of that. Of course, but it's undeniable to then say there's a difference, though, if somebody has equity and they're a literal partner in the company that we're moving this thing together, we're going to do this. And I think you can just get further faster if you have other people that are in the arena with you. Totally. Yep. Well, I think the saying is, if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go with others. Or go with it, right. And I think there's also safety, not necessarily safety in numbers, but I know through that partnership, I've had the longest where there's three of, or originally there was three. Now it's kind of morphed into a whole thing of its own, but you know, in the, especially in the beginning, 
you're not always going to have a good day every day, right? There were days where I wasn't having the best day or one of my partners. And there's kind of that, if it's a good partnership and it's balanced with talent, you know, with the right talent, there's that, don't worry about it. We got it. We'll carry the weight for, you know, however, you know, you need a couple of weeks. I was, you know, went through divorces with my partners where they got divorced and, you know, and sometimes remarried. And, you know, when they were going through the divorce, it was really hard on them. And it was like, I'll carry more of the load. You know, don't worry about it. Right. We still need your input. And then there were other times where I was like, I took off a month and went to India. And it was like, I went to my two partners and said, Hey, I need some time to kind of reflect and kind of go deep inside myself. Would you guys be okay if I just kind of checked out for a month and they were like, yeah. yeah. And you know, we'll step up and the team will step up. And I was like, perfect. Right. And so yeah. it, there's a power it, in that. There is power in that. And I'll tell you, there's a guy that I follow on Twitter. He's a great follow. He's got an awesome mm -hmm. newsletter and he is all about the solopreneur life. I read his stuff I and mean, he's got good content. He makes, gosh, I think he puts it out there. I think his business does 2 million revenue. So he, like he's oh. a, He's a unicorn in the sense of like, he's got a few little V, uh, I won't say little, that, I don't mean that, mm -hmm. I don't mean that yeah. to be disrespectful. I think he has a few people that's helping him, but he truly is a one man show. Right. I look at that and I think, this is interesting, but I don't want this. Like, this no. is not what I want. This is not, that is not the business I want to build. Okay. I just like doing business just like I like doing life with people. Right. And so while yeah you think about oh he's doing two million he probably has like no expenses basically right right you know? most of that you know big share of that's dropping to the bottom line yeah yeah bit for sure mm -hmm. and certainly that's aspirational and i and again i'm not knocking the guy at all but i think it's like okay well i don't really want that and then also there was a time that i thought i'm going to build a 25 million dollar company and it's going to mm -hmm. have 50 employees i don't want that either i don't want that right. either and where i've settled is I like the concept of a lifestyle business, two to right. 12 team members, very high revenue per mm -hmm. person, mm -hmm. between two hundred fifty dollars to $500,000 revenue per team mm -hmm. member, mm -hmm. have a small group of people who are really bought into making a difference, truly making a difference in people's lives. And then a couple million dollars in top line revenue, really good, healthy profit margins. Mm -hmm. That's what I want. That feels right to me if we're talking between the two. Right, right. right. So, yep. And that's really kind of what I try to optimize things for now. Mm -hmm. And that's what you help other business owners, I'm assuming, do, right? That's kind Absolutely. of your your role there. Absolutely. And so so you went to college. Yeah. Well, it's like, okay, we're going back to the show where we, we went to, we, we, you went to college, you got out, you went through the sales thing. Then yep. you had that kind of the health scare with the panic attacks. And then you said that was kind of some steps out. What were some of those steps out of that stress and anxiety? I like to try to give like mm -hmm. really impactful moments that happen like down in the weeds and tell yeah. you, so there was one, I was in Toronto. I was actually at Dan Sullivan strategic coach. Oh, yeah. yep. So we're doing yep. this exercise and that had been, I don't know, that was maybe my fourth event or, or fourth, you know, workshop that I'd been to. And so this guy that was really not a part of our group, he came in and tall guy, I'm tall and he was really tall and he was super fit and he was really laid back five. He sat right next to me. And so we're doing this exercise it was the 10 X exercise, basically, uh -huh. where you take your yep. revenue, multiply it times 10, and then say like, it was, it was the idea was get your head like thinking bigger. Yes. Basically. Right. Okay? Yeah. So you've heard him. If, if you know Dan yep. Sullivan, you've yep. heard him talk about this. Yeah. So we do this exercise and we have the thinking time and we do it ourselves. And then we had to come together and he was my partner. And I wish I could remember his name because I'd love to go back and connect with him and tell him how much this impacted me. So we do the thing and I go first. Well, mm -hmm. it was a good thing I went first because if he had gone first, I wouldn't have done mine. Okay? Right, right. You wouldn't have been honest. You would have been like, have done oh, and then we added another yeah. zero. <laughs> so, so I do mine and I'm like going through that. And he's really like listening and he's nodding his head. Okay, okay, that sounds good. And he's asked me some really good questions, very intimate. Right. So he says, okay, so my personal income last year was 5 million. So 10X of that would be 50 million. My company <laughs> did 40. And I said, wait, 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 wait. You brought in $5 million personally last year? Right. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. the company, we did 40 million and I was like, I had not been like that close to somebody, you know, doing right. that. And of course there's people right. doing, I was blown away. I was like, I'm not even playing the same game, right? We're in business. We're doing the same exercise. I said, man, I'm so embarrassed to have even done this exercise. And he was so kind in the way mm -hmm. that he then walked me through his own story 
Mm-hmm. And then how things inspired him. And that was a pivotal moment for me. Like, I don't remember right. the rest of the workshop, but I remember yep. that moment. And so it got me to indeed thinking bigger, but it more than anything got me to thinking differently. And mm-hmm. I started to think, man, I am working just as hard as this guy. Right. Am I rowing in the right boat here? Right. Like, And so I started to think, well, what would it actually take to get my current business to that. And I started to go, I'm not so sure I can. Right. And so it made me think I'm rowing just as hard, mm-hmm. but he's in a speedboat and I'm in a canoe. Right. Yep. Because of the nature of that business. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah, totally. And I think that's and a great so, point. And so what it did is it started to open my eyes to other forms of business. That was at 2016, basically. Oh, wow. That's mm-hmm. when uh, my entrepreneurial career really, I felt like started. Okay. Mm-hmm. So like I had the drive, the ambition, the resiliency, the determination, the hard work, all of those kind of elements and characteristics were in me, but I was just not applying it in the necessarily the right place. And Ooh. so I started to begin to kind of see, okay, wait a minute, there's a whole nother world out here to be able to scale a company from zero to a million dollars and do it a lot faster or mm-hmm. go to five or whatever that may be. So obviously I just shared with you, my desire is not to build the business he built. He was a financial advisor as well. Oh, wow. He yeah. was a financial, that's a... Wow. Good for you. That's that's interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, he was a former baseball player, played in the majors. Um, Uh He played, um, anyway, he's from Canada, but he played baseball. He got recruited by Merrill Lynch and he kind of went in a traditional path. Right. And then he ended up just going out on his own. And then, of course, he ended up building the company with financial advisors underneath him. But that was the essence of it. And I thought, wait a minute, that's in a business that people can make sense of, right? So Mm -hmm. sometimes people hear, Maybe as an example, Matt, healthcare, and they're like, oh, I don't even know how to start a healthcare company, right? Right, Or a SaaS business. They're like, I don't know how to code, so I can't start a SaaS business, so forget that. So Mm -hmm. I thought, I think it was the nature of his business also, too, that made me think, huh, okay, I kind of know the financial services world a little bit. Right. But he's just taking it a different way. And I started to feel like, okay, I could actually do this and really mm-hmm. change the trajectory for me. And along the way, I did fall in love with coaching. I started sharing with other people what was changing in me. Mm-hmm. And I love these kind of conversations. I just mm-hmm. kind of started geeking out on business a lot more. Yep. And then ultimately, I mean, I can say this safely. I, I really do believe that God's put me on the planet to mm-hmm. share my own journey, the lessons that I've learned with other people and Mm -hmm. to put those in frameworks Mm -hmm. that people can actually use in their business. And then even in future businesses, a lot of our clients have two or three companies that they're wanting to be able to grow Mm -hmm. and they can take our concepts, our frameworks and apply it to multiple. Right. Because they're more principle based. Yep. That's very cool. Yeah. I love that. And so that's when, what you've been doing, it sounds like, ever since you kind of had this yeah, first client was late 2017. Um, uh-huh. and as whenever I started doing that and that was almost, <laughs> it was coaching, but it was really more me and the partner at the time. It was more outsourced COO. Okay. It was really, right. It was. Got they it. paid yep. us $5,000 a month to basically right. run their business. <laughs> well, that's a good deal for them. <laughs> that was a really good deal for them. Okay. In fact, so if you're still for hire for that, <laughs> I've got some, stuff yeah, no, no, sure. I'm out on that business. That has sunset that, that model did not scale. <laughs> yeah. It did not okay? work out very well. It did well. not work. Yeah. Okay. A full-time gig. I'm making five grand a month. Yeah. That yeah. doesn't sound great. I have to tell you, though, there was a funny thing about that. We went to our first client. We sat down with him. His name was Frank. And we had thrown together a little PowerPoint. We didn't have a bank account. We didn't have an LLC. We didn't have anything. And I love he, it. he said, well, how much is it? And we said, $5,000. And he was like, sounds good. He pulls out his checkbook. He goes, who do I write the check to? <laughs> right. He knew. We were like, um, <laughs> I love I said, it. It's going to be a couple of weeks before we cash this, you know, because right. like, oh my gosh, we got to, we don't have anything. Right, right. And then we got our second client. That was our first two clients for probably nine months because, right. but we cut our teeth really learning. Okay, wait a minute. This has worked for us, but is this going to work for other places? Okay. Right. And I really fell in love with the teaching component of it, but I did mm-hmm. realize what I missed was I wanted the business owner to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And if they were totally removed, I was like, no, I really want to teach you these things. Okay. Because what's the end game for you? If I leave, okay. So we've installed all of these tracking systems, right. Better compensation plans, 
you know, for the team members, better financial management, financial discipline. Okay, we've done all this, but if you're not here learning it, when we leave, it's just going to create a vacuum. It's going to fall apart. Exactly. Right. right. And that's actually what ended up happening. And so well, then of I was like, I don't like this. And so I ended up uh, starting at the time, it was called the Hamner Group. And then I pivoted the name over to Business Growth Curator. And that was in 2000, 2019. Mm, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It makes complete sense. And yeah, that's what I, going through the leadership stuff I've gone through, there's a place out of Dallas called the Stegan Leadership Institute. That's mm. kind of, I've been associated with that for 10 years now. And, and yeah, they only work with the founder, the business owner, and then they'll work with C-suite and then kind of go out throughout the organization. But their thing is too, yeah, if you don't have the person who owns it, who has all the control, basically, if they don't yeah. understand the principles, then guess what? why bother training anybody else? Because it's like, 100%. even if the rest of the team becomes highly functional and highly versed in this, you've, st you've still got the dysfunction happening where the dysfunction was happening all along, which is at the top, right? So if, you're, if, if your business is screwed up, guess what? You're screwed up. And I'm saying that from knowing that I've had some really screwed up business. I didn't have maybe the intellectual understanding of what was going on. And so I had to go educate myself I think anytime we get to the point where we stop educating ourselves is where we start having problems. Yeah. I mean, I have a really wide funnel is like, I like to tell people what I have to do is and the reason I actually named the company business growth curator uh -huh. is because uh, taking in, we, we try to curate the very best of the best stuff for our right. clients. Okay. Yep. So we'll say for Matt, where you are, here are some of the best books to read that's best mm -hmm. for you, the best podcast to listen to. We're really curating the very best of the best things that we think are best for our clients and then be able to share those resources, you know, to them. Like, for instance, a lot of EOS stuff has influenced yeah. me very, very heavily. Yeah, yeah. Great stuff. Um, it's great stuff. Yeah, yep. for sure. Well, Gino worked for Vern Harnish at Scaling Up. Scaling mm. Vern learned a lot of his stuff from Jim Collins. And so a lot of Ooh, stuff is nice. passed down. Right. And so I like to think a lot of the things, and I mean this respectfully to EOS, mm -hmm. is some of the EOS methodology. I was actually an EOS implementer for a period of time. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We ran a EOS and a couple of the businesses I'm involved with. Yep. Yeah. So a lot of the things, a lot of the tools we use have a nod to yeah, of course, EOS influenced things. by, yeah, influenced by, certainly not plagiarized by, by no means, but influenced by, but it's like, that doesn't really work for my clients, but I get the general concept of it, right. for instance, right? And so we have a thing called Blueprint. I mean, the mm -hmm. reason our program is actually called Blueprint, because what architects use, they use Blueprints. Blueprints, so that's why yes. we call it Blueprint. Mm -hmm. And so we help all of our clients to create a Blueprint for their business. Well, what do we think is a Blueprint? Well, we think a Blueprint is your three-year vision, your one-year OKRs, mm -hmm. and your quarterly targets, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, you can look at EOS and say, like, there's some elements of that that are fairly similar. Mm -hmm. Well, then we also think you need to have your core four values. Mm -hmm. You need to have your key results that you track on a scoreboard on there. Right. And yep. then you also need to have, well, there's five things that we think of whenever building a plan or your strategy mm -hmm. to make mm -hmm. all that happen. Mm -hmm. And so we put that on a one pager that we want our clients to be able to say, okay, here's my three year. Here's my one year. Here's my 90 day. Here's mm -hmm. my core values. Here's my strategy to make that happen. And here are the key results we're tracking on a scoreboard. Does that make sense? Love it. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Very cool. So we think that that's the actual blueprint of the business yep. that we feel like that the business owner should be able to have on his or her either printed call, or on their iPad or something yeah, like that. Call it dashboard, right? I mean, it's some form of dashboard or flight plan if you wanted to call it or, absolutely. right? And if you don't have that, then yeah, you're going to get what you get, right? Yep, and usually absolutely. not the best results. No. Well, there's not as much intentionality behind it. Mm -hmm. There's just kind of like, well, a lot of business owners will say, well, what do you want to do? And they'll say, well, I just want to grow. I just want to make more. I just mm -hmm. want to make more money. I want to do better. I want to work less. And it's like, okay, but it's too ambiguous. And so right. we really get them to get it out of their head because a lot of that mm -hmm. stuff lives up here. Right. And what they have shared with us is that we try to lay the space or open the space up mm -hmm. for them for the first time to get it out of their head mm -hmm. and get it down on paper and then be able to get it down in paper in a safe place with other entrepreneurs that say, I can relate to that. Okay. Yep. Totally. And so they have shared things with us that they haven't even shared with maybe even with their spouse about like, right. yeah, this is really, this is what I really want to do. Mm -hmm. And then 
it becomes a, again, a safe place where somebody else says, Hey, I respect, I get that. I get that, you know? And so that honesty, that willingness to be open in a community is really, really healthy for small business owners. Cause otherwise it's lonely. It's, it is. Yeah. yeah really lonely. They're surrounded by a team, customers, their phones pinging all the time, but yet they feel completely alone Yep. because then sometimes you're like, what am I doing all this for? Like, where am I actually going? What's the direction of the company? And so we really try to not give them homework in our program. We try to actually do the thing, right? We'll put timers for 20 minutes where everybody's on zoom actually doing thinking time in that moment right then oh nice right? yeah 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 yeah. because if we don't then there's like oh it's just another thing on my to-do list which you're not going to get to and so mm -hmm. then from there i think the shares where it's like okay matt we just had this question what what did you write down and there's like oh man i never thought of it that way that's really cool in right. the different industries you've heard i got a niche down it's like Honestly, one of the best things about our community is the fact that people own different businesses. Right, know? right. Because then really you're pulling is. from different industries and applying it in your own. Absolutely. You got somebody yep. from healthcare. You got somebody yep. in behavioral therapy company, somebody in a right. recruiting company, somebody right. owns an insurance agency, somebody owns all of those different things come together to say, oh, well, I actually never thought of it that way. Sometimes it's aspirational. Somebody is like, man, this guy's really, or this lady's really getting it done. I want to reach out to them and connect with them. And then other times it's this, it's to be there for somebody who's struggling. It's like, Hey, I just had my key employee leave and mm -hmm. I'm having a really hard time with it. You know, how have you guys been able to work through that? So the community has been one of the biggest blessings that I couldn't have seen that that coming together the way that it has. And it's really inspiring. Yes. I love that. I love all the stuff you said. I'll amen it. I'll, I'll shout it from the back of the pews. Amen. Preach it. Pre preach it, preacher. The, uh, so I, I totally, again, today's call was totally where I needed what I needed to hear. And and uh, and I'm going to have some questions for you offline. There are a lot of, I've got more questions for you offline than I do on the podcast. Oh, so, awesome. awesome. Uh, if, well, I enjoyed if, the chat. If you've got some time to stick around. Okay, good. So, but I do want to get, so one, thank you for uh, this conversation has been very enlightening and I've noticed that the conversations I'm having lately are very, almost like, I don't want to say this, almost like saying, yes, you keep going on that track. I so believe that we need to bring business leaders together, business owners together to make the better world. We got to start at home and we got to start with what we have. And I think we can use business as a force for good in the world. 100%. Once we start supporting each other, when we're not supporting each other, then it's just going to be this feeling of separation. You use the word loneliness. I've heard that so many times in my podcast here over the last month is business leaders, business owners starting to tap into that. Hey, being a business owner is lonely. Let's just get that out. I think, I think being a human being is lonely, but when you're a business owner, it's a new level of loneliness because you have responsibility for other people. You feel responsible for other people's lives and you can't really tell other people about the stress because you don't know who you can tell, right? You okay, can't necessarily, no you, you don't, ne you don't really want to bring that home because then you stress out your family. You know, you, you, you really can't tell people that don't own businesses because they don't understand. It's like, oh yeah, you, you're making you know all this money and you got all the worries. It's like, well, yeah, actually I, <laughs> that is part of it because some days I don't make any money, right? I mean, some days I still have all of this stuff, all the bills and don't have the money, right? And some days I do. So there's, I, I think the conversation we're having is a conversation that needs to happen more and more and more and more and more, which is you don't have to do this alone, right? There is a place to come. There is this uh, a safe haven for you to come because ultimately, most business owners want to make their communities a better community. They want to make the world a better world. They want more for their families. It's not just greed for the sake of greed. Those people aren't attracted to this conversation. Absolutely. I have to tell you, I, I think this is a good place to, to, to share with your audience this. I think that one of the, the single hardest things to do in life, and I definitely think it is even more so for a business owner, entrepreneur, founder is your willingness to raise your hand and say, will you help me? Right. Oh, totally. Not, can you help me? Can no, I? Yes, no, I can. No, right. Can I? Yes, I can. <laughs> right. But right. will you help me? Okay. Right. That, that, that is so hard for us to do is to say, because we have to put on the armor. I want Matt to think I'm successful. I right. want you to think I got all my 
shit crap together. together. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. We can say because SHIT on this show. I, I, all right. Well, I, I want you to think I got my shit together. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Like right. I, I, I'm going to put up a front. Yep. And I can put my front up with either my EBITDA. Yeah, right. Or my, or my revenue. Or my or how many my employees I have. Number size, yeah, yeah, exactly. Or my yeah. trophies yeah. or whatever you want to put up or my car or my house or my trip or yeah. my vacation yeah. or my Instagram account or how many, whatever it is. Okay. I want you to see that. Right. And it becomes exhausting versus being willing to say, no, no, no. How are you really? Right. How are you really? Uh, he's not a client, but he's a really good friend. He's incredibly successful. He's got really four different businesses. Mm -hmm. And one day, you know, he was, we were doing this kind of initial song and dance. And I said, David, I got a question. Cause he's got, a, he's just somebody that people are just gnawing on him all the time. Yeah. And I said, how are you actually really doing? And he said, dude, I'm exhausted. Right. I'm really tired. Anyway, that started on a conversation. So, you know, we ended up having a, we actually ended up having a real conversation right. instead of like, oh, that's good, man. How's business? How's family? Right. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great, man. You keep killing it. You know, right. That's yeah. what, that's what ends, ends up happening. You know, and I, right. just, I used to be that guy, by the way, I used yeah. to be that guy. And now I think I told you, I was like, no, man, I, I just would rather be real and yep. be um, honest. And, mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and I still struggle myself, you know, at times. I mean, mm -hmm. there's no, no question. It's, there's a journey. So anyway, totally, totally, totally. Um, my closing question uh, for this, for the recording here today for, for the audience is if you had where you can you can take it outside the scope of business we'll just say we'll call it we're all you know there's eight billion humans on the face of the earth if you had one message that you would like to impart to all eight billion if all eight billion got like some type of a listening device or went to all of everybody went to a website and you had one message you could give that was just very crystal clear and very what what would you want to impart to your brothers and sisters all over the world in that message Ideas are everywhere. Implementation is everything. <laughs> Ideas are everywhere. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. We were in I'm just ready. information overload. Uh huh. I mean, we can we just all have access to information, so much information, so many ideas, so many things. At the end of the day, if you're wanting to really make a difference in your business, in your community, in your life, in the life of the people around you, it comes down to implementation and execution. You right. got to do the thing. You got to do the thing. So um, there's probably a lot of other things I could share around maybe faith or around yep. other things. But like from a business perspective, that to me is is well, uh, for sure the thing that uh, that resonates with me the most. It, it sits in my head quite a bit. I actually will share another one. Yes, please. Do. Is, uh, I, I'll share another one that's probably more as a human or philosophical mm -hmm. is that and uh, this is not an original idea from me. But it's this idea of that I want to be, I want to one day meet the man I could have become uh -huh. and then say, hello, old friend. I know you because. I right. Can't. Yeah. I love that. That's nice. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. I don't want to, you know, look back and say, well, you could have become this person, but you didn't, you know, because right. of either fear or insecurity or you didn't play all out or whatever that may be, you know, and I wasn't there for my kids and for my family and for my friends. And, you know, so life is a lot bigger than revenue and profit and all that stuff is important. I'm not saying it's not, but right. just uh, like we, we are people outside of our businesses. That's not who we are. Hey, hopefully that served all of you and you maybe learned a few things about me that maybe you didn't know along the way. Hey, big shout out to our podcast sponsors, Club Capital, Autopilot Recruiting, and Coach P Consulting. As we get into getting closer to your individual personal tax return season, I know many of you are starting to look at your financials, reflect back. And, you know, unfortunately, this is time that maybe some of you, this is the first time you've actually started to look at your profitability from last year. And you say, you know what, I think I need to actually get financials on a regular basis and be able to use those financials to make better decisions in my business. Go to Club Capital, go to club.capital. You can see all the services that they offer, but you can also book a no obligation demo with someone else to get to have an idea of exactly how this works and compare it to what you're doing today. Go to club.capital.
you know, there's just a lot of energy and noise out there right now around what's going to happen in the marketplace. None of us have a crystal ball, but at the end of the day, you want to build a team, a championship level team with A players. And while we don't know what the market's going to do, and with all of you, you may have just different budgets to be able to work with. Well, regardless of what your budget is, or regardless of what the market, the labor market is out there of being able to hire teams, and while it's gotten challenging, Autopilot Recruiting can be able to help put in front of you some quality candidates that you can bring on your team, whether you're working for looking for a sales acquisition person or you're working for looking for someone to be in customer service, account management, et cetera, maybe even someone to help manage some of the marketing. Autopilot Recruiting can be your outsourced, kind of your secret weapon, so to speak, to be able to help you to be able to bring on some A players, build that championship team and make 2023 your best year. Go to autopilotrecruiting.com and let them know that you heard about them on the Club Capital Leadership Podcast. A lot of times I love to think about how do you attract, how do you develop and how do you retain A players? How do you attract, how do you develop and how do you retain A players? And where autopilot recruiting can help you is in attracting those A players. But then the second part is how do you develop them and how do you retain A players? And one of the biggest things, yeah, they want to be able to make good money. They want to have a compensation plan that compensate them fairly for the value that they're bringing into your business but they also want to develop in their skill sets. They want to be able to do more and learn that. And they may not even necessarily want to move up in the organization, but they just want to expand in their skill sets. They want to be developed, especially if you get A players. And so you know that, and you know the difficulty of bringing on A players and bringing on people as a whole. But then once you get them on board, you may have a, all right, this is how we train you, this is how we onboard you. But what about a regular personal development plan? Well, part of that can be with whenever you are able to put your team in front of someone like David Peterson, he and his team are going to share with you kind of the behind the scenes things of what's actually working today. Because in a lot of things, yeah, there are some principles that worked 10 years ago, they worked 20 years ago, and they'll work 20 years from now. But then there are some tactics, there are some strategies that were not even things that people were using a couple of years ago, but they're working today and vice versa. Well, David is going to be able to show you and your team so you can actually help develop them and see what is working to help them to be able to scale to three locations and 25, 30 plus team members in their organization. Go to coachpconsulting.com and let David know you heard about him on the Club Capital Leadership Podcast. All right, everyone. Until next episode, lead well.